Hey, thank you much. And thank you very much, folks, for, for coming back. And again, I apologize for last week. Uh, we're dealing with some virus issues in the factory and and they're, they're, the safety of our people are, is the most important thing we have. Anyway, DUI is now open and we are running a, a, a partial crew. And as time goes on and, and we work out uh, how do we keep people separate and how we keep them safe, we're going to do that. But but keeping our people safe is the most important thing that, that we have to do. Okay, now. So, well, Dick, just to clarify, it's it's not a virus that we're saying that we have the, because of the COVID virus, we are making sure the environment's safe. We don't have the virus. but Correct. That's right. We're not going to let it in. That's all there is to it. I mean, even I, when I show up, I have to go to the front door and get my temperature taken and put on gloves and a mask and all that good stuff. Yeah. Sorry so, about that. Okay. I. Back to you. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk about CF tunnel material today. And again, the CF tunnel material uh, is the result of a failed experiment. And let me explain to you. Uh, at the same time, the CF tunnel suit became the Harley Davidson of the diving industry. It was the one suit that didn't leak uh, and it held up under an incredible abuse. In the very beginning, on the East Coast, you, you had a, a German subcontractor during World War II that put down a lot of wrecks. And therefore, there's a lot of wreck diving going on on the East Coast, which does not happen uh, or was not happening at any rate on the West Coast. And um, uh, but all the diving was being done by what they call six packs. In other words, the, the charter boat was a small boat. It could only have six divers on it. And uh, when you got on one of those boats, because you were diving at 150 feet and deeper, uh, you had long decompression runs. And if anything went wrong, everyone on that boat had to turn to to, to save or, or, or rescue whoever was, was injured. So the result was they only wanted the best possible divers to be in those crews because if you had any kind of an accident, it stopped the whole dives for the rest of the day. At any rate, so uh, the, the, what they decided was, and these guys made the decision, was that if you were a diver that was new enough about deep diving to be qualified to go to those depths, you had a CF-100 suit. They, it was the most expensive suit there was. But if you didn't have a, a CF-200 suit, then they figured that you weren't really uh, uh, a good enough diver. And that was the rule they used for a long time. And also, much like the Harley-Davidson motorcycle, um, uh, you, you, you don't show up at a Harley rally on your Honda. It, it's, it's not done. And uh, certainly you didn't show up on one of those boats with something other than a DOI CF-200 suit. Now, the, the way we made CF-200 material was a, a, a deep, dark secret for many years. Uh, and and we today, if you come to DUI, I'll show you how we do it. In fact, is if any of you want to come to DUI, I'll show you where your suit was born and the process by which we go through to make your suit. Once people come and see the process we have, most of them can understand how we can do it for the price we do. At the same time, when you first buy one, you say, why do these things cost so much money? Once you come and go through the factory, you'll see how. At any rate, Okay, so how did this how did this happen? First of all, uh, when I started off diving back in 1958, uh, we were making wetsuits and we made them from kits. and And the process of building, uh, we designed the first uh, Farmer John trousers. We made jackets that we, we we attached the hood to the jacket. We eliminated the zippers, which in turn reduced the flow of water through the suit. So that's, that's how we developed uh, our thermal protection to start with. Now, uh, the, uh, when we started making wetsuits for guys to use in offshore oil, and when they're working on an offshore platform, you have all the barnacles on the platforms, the tube worms, the, the uh, spiny oysters. Uh, the, the result is that if you wear, wear an ordinary wetsuit in an offshore oil uh, environment, it rips the suit to shreds. And about three months is about all you can expect a sport diving wetsuit to last in the offshore oil world. 
And so when we first started making hot water suits, we made them out of wetsuit material. And of course, the same thing would happen to the suits. They would be torn to shreds in a short period of time. And they couldn't afford to be paying the kind of money it cost to make a hot water suit uh, that would fall apart in three months. So we had to find a new material. And we went through all kinds of stuff. And what we ended up with, this is a piece of, uh, of hot water material. Ordinary wetsuit material, which uh, is actually, it's black uh, cloth. It is, it's like cheesecloth. And if you see here, you can see right through it. Can you see me right through there? Okay, that's all that is. And they have black glue on black rubber. So the result is when you get done, it looks reasonably substantial, but it's not. So we went, we went to a, a bunch of different people who knit fabric because you, we, we need something that has stretch to it about the same as skin. And this is the material we ended up with. And as you can see, you can't see through it. Okay, it's that, it's that thick. And it's got to be something like 20 times thicker than the material that's on an ordinary everyday wetsuit. So that's what we made and we, we made it for hot water suits and a hot water suit that would last three months now was lasting an average about three and a half years. So as you can see, it, it made a significant improvement in how long the material lasts. But again, that was for an industrial application. We didn't think of it for uh, sport diving. Um, then when you, when you came to uh, uh, dry suits, uh, you have the picture there of the tunnel entry. Okay, this is a, a Bell Aqua dry suit. And you can see the tunnel entry there in the, in, in, in the middle. And if you look carefully, you can see he's got surgical tubing that's wrapped around there. And uh, that's that, what you wrap that around and around and around and it creates so much pressure that it seals off the suit. This is the... Uh, uh, this is the more modern uh, uh, clamp that you, you take and put this around there, clamp it down, close it up, then turn, turn the screw in and it seals off the suit. Um, then we had, um, so that, that was where that was. Then we ended up in the first uh, suit I made, which we called the Arctic suit. We used a suit out of a space suit, a zipper out of a space suit. Now, a spacesuit has uh, uh, a, a uh, you can't really see it in this picture because the, the lips, there are two lips that close behind that zipper that because you're, what you're doing is, is having, uh, uh, you're trying to seal the air in. In our case, we put the, the seal on the outside because what we're trying to do is keep the water out. This is a drawing of the current zipper that everyone uses. And, and here, the teeth of the zipper are pulling it together and the, the fabric is being pressed together in the center. So that's how the, the current zippers work. And even the plastic zippers work on much the same principle. Uh, uh, and again, your plastic zippers are never gonna last as long as your brass zippers. And it's, when, when we run tests, we, we have a machine, it's a hydraulic, uh, uh, it operates on air pressure, and it zips the zipper up and down 100 times, then puts pressure behind it, and, and then as long as it holds, it then goes back and runs the zipper up down 100 times. And so we, we cycle zippers thousands of times, and the, the average, uh, the uh, YKK zippers, which are the best, uh, will will run about four times as many cycles as a plastic zipper will, um, uh, and that's that's why on all of our premium suits we use the the brass zipper. At any rate, okay. So uh, the first uh, uh, suits I made were we called the 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 the, uh, the Arctic suits. Then uh, then we had C Lab two and C Lab three come by, and that's when we found out that insulation. Uh, ordinary insulation is, is used in wetsuits or even dry suits uh, aren't going to be enough in helium. In fact, in helium, uh, you can lose at 450 feet in, in 40 degree water, you can lose more heat through your lungs than your body can manufacture. 
Again, I want to repeat that. At 450 feet, breathing helium, you can lose more heat to your lungs than your body can manufacture. So therefore, when you get to 450 feet and deeper, we have to heat the helium the guy's breathing. Because again, even with a hot water suit, uh, he, he, he can't survive there for very long. Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's when we realized that we had to have something else. So we, 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 we had to augment the, the insulation by using the hot water. And that's where the hot water suits came from, uh, was, was doing that. Um, the, now, at the same time, bear in mind, we had the Sea Lab program. And at the same time, I'm, I'm doing all kinds of work with the Navy. And again, back, I, t I told you last time about riding with SDVs. When, when we're riding in SDVs, uh, the guys are sitting still and they have to sit still for as much as six hours at a time. Uh, or if you will, they have three hours into their mission, do their mission, three hours coming back. So the guy has to be underwater for three hours. Well, sitting still, uh, you're not generating a lot of heat. And so trying to keep them warm is, is a real problem. Uh, in addition to that, one of the problems we had was in the first boat boats and because the, the submarine itself the stv is is negative buoyant so in the middle of the of the submarine we had this big tank and it was about 18 inches in diameter and about three foot tall and we would put air in there and it was open at the bottom so you could put air in there to create buoyancy or that's right because otherwise if you took all the air out the, the submarine would sink to the bottom and you couldn't that would be, it, it would, could not maintain neutral buoyancy. So what we did was we put air in there. Well, the problem was when you're going into a wave and let's say that you have a six foot wave going over the top of you, you're, you're, you're on, on uh, uh, a closed circuit breathing oxygen. So therefore you got to keep your boat at no, no deeper than 25 feet. So when the wave would go over you, say the wave is six feet tall, well, that's going to create pressure. When it does, the pressure would then cause the air inside the tank to shrink. When it did, the boat became heavy. So then the boat would start to sink. So now the pilot is sitting there going back and forth on the stick, trying to, trying to hold it. You add to that, you have four people in there. Let's say they're, 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 they're wearing uh, 25 pounds worth of, uh, of lead. Their wetsuits that they were wearing, or, or dry suits, either one actually, would compress as the wave went over them. So the result is you could have a change in buoyancy of maybe 40 or 50 pounds when a wave went over the top of you. That made it impossible for the pilot to maintain control. So what I did was I said, look, if maybe I can take 3 h material, shrink the material down, and, uh, and therefore eliminate the buoyancy, the changing in the suits. And I did that. I took a paint spray pot. I put the, the suits inside the paint spray pot, ran the pressure up to a, about 100 PSI. And that did in fact cause the material to shrink. If you take a lead weight, put it on any wetsuit made by anybody, leave it there overnight. The next morning you come up, pick up the lead weight and there's an impression for the lead weight. Neoprene has what's called a very poor memory. So therefore the material would become thinner. So that's what I was doing, was trying to take the, the, uh, the, the buoyancy change out of it. It worked, except that the suit became incredibly uncomfortable to wear. And uh, in fact, the material looked like a prune and it was very unsuccessful, very un, it was not fun to wear at all. At the same time, they, they decided that rather than have an open bottom tank in the middle of the submarine, they, they took and put a closed bottom tank. So they created what they call a hydraulic, hydraulic accumulator. So you put a, an air bladder in there that has uh, air in it, and then you pump water into it. So you pump water into it or pump water out of it to change the buoyancy. And that solved the buoyancy problem in the boat. So therefore, they didn't need my invention anymore. So when I tried to cut that material, it was really, really tough. And I, I had no idea what made it so tough. But I put it aside, said, hey, it's a failed experiment. Doesn't work. That's the end of it. So then the Navy decided they would build the Mark 12 uh, system to replace the, the, uh, the Mark 5. The Mark 5 was the big copper helmet. So, and this is the, the Mark 12. Uh, and 
the suit that they had in that is a coverall they're wearing on the outside of it and the suit inside was made of wetsuit rubber and we made like 600 of them uh for the navy and when they when they started wearing them even though they they had a coverall on the outside of them the suits wore out very quickly uh and so they called me up and said, Dick, you know, look, this, this thing works, but not very well. And the suits wear out in a very short period of time. Do you have anything? And I said, well, yeah, I, I had this material one time that was really, really tough. So what I did was I took and started experimenting and I took the hot water material, made it a lot thinner, and then we put it under pressure. And that in turn became uh, the onset of CF tunnel material. You have this slide that shows the compression. There you go. Okay, at one atmosphere, uh, what you have here is the, the rubber is, uh, actually rubber is a pretty good conductor of heat. Uh, so that's why they put the air bubbles inside the foam rubber to create insulation. In fact, is if you could make a suit out of wood, wood is a good insulator. And that's, we build houses and whatnot, of it, but it's, it's a pretty good insulator. The problem is that wood doesn't bend, so therefore we can't make diving suits out of wood. But now here we have uh, uh, the air bubbles. Now, now, if we go underwater down to 100 feet, you can see that it actually at one, at one atmosphere, 33 feet, then the air bubbles become half their size. And if we keep going down deeper, the air bubbles become smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why the, your suit becomes, thin, becomes less warm as, as the depth you go. Okay, now uh, give me the other slide. Okay, okay, now, okay, and when we crush these bubbles, what we do is we, we put it inside of a chamber and we run the pressure up to about 1,500 pounds. And when you do that, it just crushes those, those down to nothing. In fact, here, here you can see we have a little bit of air in the middle of the cell. When we put it under 1,500 pounds, there is no air bubbles left. Not only that, but we keep it under pressure for a period of time in which the same thing happens to those air bubbles bubbles as happens to your body except in reverse. The air, the, because we, we put it in, in water, then pressurize it. So the nitrogen, that's, that's what's inside the, the air bubble, the nitrogen comes out into the water. The result is when we, when, when we, uh, we, we keep it there for 24 hours, then when we bring the, the, the chamber back up, the air has got into the, the, the water and the water gets the bend. So the water is milky when we bring it up. The result is, is that now where you had something that was three sixteenths of an inch thick, now it's now only one eighth of an inch or one sixteenth of an inch thick. Most people realize that when they are wearing a wetsuit and they descend in the water, that the suit becomes thinner. What most people aren't aware of is not only does it become thinner, it becomes smaller. Okay, so therefore, for instance, if you have a forty-inch waist, you're going to lose about five percent. So therefore, you're going to your waist is going to become two inches thinner. Now, what happens in your waist is not so much, but when it comes to like your arms, if you're doing work underwater, like like using a wrench, what is it, if you want to measure the biceps on a weightlifter, you you say, wait, well, I want to measure your biceps. The weightlifter say, wait a minute, and he drops down and does push-ups. As soon as he does push-ups, what happens is his the muscles are demanding blood, and the muscle will expand the muscle will get much bigger uh, okay when you're wearing a wetsuit and you do the same thing like move, moving a wrench underwater then your muscle expands but the rubber won't let it the rubber won't let it so what you've just done there you put a tourniquet on your muscle and anyone who's done a lot of work underwater knows that your arms will start to ache they don't ache out of the water but they ache in the water and, and that's because you put now a tourniquet on your arm. So for commercial divers, that's, again, that's also why they wear very thin suits because the muscle can expand and, and it'll stretch the rubber. What we did was, and this, this is something I, I made for dive stores. Uh, God, this has been, what, 30 years ago. This, I have samples of the wetsuit material, okay? And, and I would have a, 
magnifying glass. And when you put the magnifying glass on top and look inside, you can see the little air bubbles. Then we show you where, where we crushed it. And the air bubbles are gone. I mean, they are down to nothing. What you see today is that they'll take the rigor wetsuit material and cut it really thin and then glue a nylon on the outside of it. But it's not the same thing as CF2 material at all. You, weigh, you, you measure rubber, the density of rubber, by how much it weighs per pound. How much it weighs per pound. So therefore, if you get a suit that's made of really thin material, you have very little rubber between the nylon on the outside and the nylon on the inside. When you get a CF200 material, you've got all, that's solid rubber between the inside and the outside. So therefore, that's why that suit is so much tougher. And also, when we made this material and we sent it to the Navy to put on the Mark 12 suit, they said, wow, this is really something. It, it, it holds up. It holds up. The, uh, the Navy got very excited about it. And the, material, the Navy Materials Lab in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, they came out and they, they, they made the CF2 material a whole new class of material. And the Navy's Diver Thermal Protection System is made up of CF200 material. To this day, they're still using it. And uh, uh, all of your EOD suits, which are non-magnetic, are made out of CF200 material because it's, it's just that tough. We have made uh, a new material called the CLX suit, which is about equally tough. Uh, it works on a different principle than the CF200 does. The CF200 material will stretch about the same as skin does. So therefore, a lot of your cave divers, they want a suit fits really, really close to them. So you can, you can make a CF200 suit fit that close. You can't make a CLX suit fit that close because CLX material does not stretch. So, um, uh, however, CF2 material takes two days to dry, and the CLX suit takes 15, 20 minutes to dry. So if you're flying a lot, you and it weighs a lot more. It weighs a lot more. So that's uh, kind of where that comes from. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay, Mark 12 suit. Okay, made it tough. And, and, and again, the CF2 material stretches like skin. Um, Okay, now you want to give me the, the suit that shows the air air engine. The next one has a little arrows in it. There you go. Okay, now the the when you when you get in the water with an ordinary wetsuit, you're nice and warm on the surface. When you go to the bottom, you get cold. How, how come you get cold at depth that you don't get cold on the surface? And this is the reason why. When you have these small air bubbles in the suit, uh, uh, the heat will transfer from the rubber into the air bubble. Then the air transfers, uh, rotates up in the air bubble until it gets next to the next bubble where it transfers the heat over to that bubble. Then it goes, then it takes the heat up to the next bubble, transfers over. So that's how the air, that's how heat transfers from one side of your wetsuit to the other side of your wetsuit. When you get down around 100 feet, you, your bubble is only going to be one quarter of the size that it was. So therefore, the heat transfers much faster, much faster. Uh, okay, so therefore, at 100 feet, your, your insulation is only one-fourth of what it was at the surface. And that's how that works. That's how the heat transfers from one side to the other. Also, most people think that a wetsuit, uh, you lose most of your heat through conduction, from the heat going from the inside to the outside. That's not quite true. What happens is water flowing through your suit. Is, is what tr transfer, you, your body heat goes to the water in your suit, then uh, the, the water transfers out of the suit. And that's why, for instance, you can urinate in your suit. It's nice and warm for a short period of time. Then when the urine leaves, the heat leaves with it. And then you're back to where you were. Uh, in fact, is most people think, well, if I, and we, we used to, we used to drink a lot of water, uh, coffee before we got in the water. That way, once we got in the water, we could urinate and feel nice and warm. The truth is that that makes you colder faster because your body has a natural uh, uh, defense mechanism. Uh, as 
when when the cold water comes in your suit, then your your, your the blood vessels in your skin uh, is actually controlled by the thalamus and at the base of your brain. But it causes your blood vessels to to shut down, and therefore you're not circulating blood by the surface. When you urinate in your suit, then the warm water comes in. You, the the message is sent to the thalamus. The thalamus says, Ah, we got warm water there. Therefore, I'm going to open the blood vessels, bring warm bring the blood back out to the surface to pick up all that heat. By the time the blood gets there, the heat's gone, and now you're going to be losing heat, uh, heat, heat to the surface, so heat out through your skin. So therefore, what happens is if you urinate in your suit, you're going to get colder faster. It feels good for a little while, I know. The fact is, if you ever wonder where the inspiration for a hot water suit came from, now you know that it, 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 in fact the first suits were called dyrene, which talks, which refers to uh, having a constant flow of urine in your suit. So now you know the the secret to that one. Anyway, so uh, uh, the, okay, we know about the, the the suit shrinking. We now know that it cuts off blood flow. We now know uh, okay now. Um, Okay, and you know how this the suit is made. So, okay. Uh, now, if you, there are lots of materials that have been, what they've done is taken wetsuit material, cut it really thin, put nylon on both sides and say, and call it compressed. Okay, compressed, ne all foam neoprene is in fact compressed because that's how they make it. They, 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 they take rubber, they, they mix it up and it looks like dough, like cookie dough. Then they put it in a mold and, and they heat the mold. When they heat the mold, the, the chemicals they put in the rubber turn to a gas and that's what causes it to expand. So therefore, the mold prevents the, the, the rubber from expanding beyond a certain amount. And that's why it's compressed. It's not the same thing as crushed. Because what we do is we take the, the, the rubber and put it into a chamber and crush it and and squish the, the air out of it. So, um, but you can't tell it from by looking at it. You can't tell it. Okay, now this this is a picture of the crushers. Okay, what these uh, stainless steel tubes there, uh, we put this, we either put a finished suit in there or we put the material in there depending on what we're making at the time. We then uh, close those up and we slide them in. Those tubes are like 20 some feet long. You slide them inside and you close that door. When you close the door, then you uh, pressurize it to 1,500 pounds. This is the uh, pumping system we use to, to uh, pump the water in. And we put it up to 1,500 pounds to leave it in there for 24 hours. When you do that, it, it compresses the material. The, the nitrogen that was in the bubbles comes out of the rubber into the water. Uh, and then when you bring the water up, it it, uh, it, it, it leaves the material permanently compressed and the nitrogen is now in the water and we flush the water down the drain. So that's, uh, and uh, at one time, uh, these were really uh, very, very secret. We, we had, uh, 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 we never let anybody back there to see it. Now we'll take anybody. So if you want to come down, we'll take you in the back and we'll show you the crushers. The, um, uh, and also, if you ever want to know whether the suit's uh, crushed with neoprene or not, weigh it, because it's going to weigh more. If it's a crushed neoprene suit, it's going to weigh a lot more than a foam rubber suit's going to weigh, um, all things being equal. Okay, uh, now, in fact, uh, if you take, uh, when we first started with this, uh, and we started making wetsuits, we made wet su we made dry suits out of wetsuit material, and I was looking for something stronger, and I went to Bob Stenton, and I said, Bob, we need a stronger material, this because the foam rubber for wetsuits just isn't holding up, and and he said, why don't you use the CF trimmer? I said, no, no, that's for commercial divers, sport divers will never go for that. Boy, was I wrong. Was I ever wrong. Uh, if you take whatever you pay for anything, add to that the cost of maintenance during its lifetime, then divide the number of uses you get into it before you wore it out, you're going to find that you're going to pay more money when you buy a CF200 suit than any other suit out there because it is the most expensive. On the other hand, if you divide the, the cost of maintenance into it, then divide the number of uses out, the CF200 suit is going to be the cheapest suit you're ever going to have to dive because it's good. We have 
we have CF drone suits out there that literally are 20 years old now. They're still diving. 20 years old and still diving. Uh, I think you have elastomer migration and other things in the suit, but uh, uh, there are people out there that have, have had their suits for 20 years and they're still diving. Um, I, I, I rest my case. Anyway, um, the, uh, now, uh, the, the, the suit was such a, well, it's like a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Like I said, you don't show up at a Harley Davidson uh, rally with a on your Honda. Uh, we had uh, uh, the Germans wanted to buy a CF Turner suits, but all the CF Turner suits were either all black or black and orange. Uh, I'm color blind, but or black and red. And uh, uh, when I, uh, when the Germans wanted to buy them in blue, I went to the guys in his coast and said, "Hey guys, they want to buy them in uh, in blue." And the guy said, "No, no, Dick, CF Turner suits are black or they're orange, and that's it. There's no other color." So I made myself a blue one, and I went out on the East Coast. And when I went out on the East Coast, uh, we went aboard the Wahoo. And this is a picture aboard the Wahoo. In fact, this on this particular dive, we removed uh, the the uh, USS San Diego was the only capital warship that was sunk during World War One, and it was actually sunk by a German mine that they laid off of Long Island. And we went in and we removed uh, ammunition out of the ammunition locker. And that's what they're holding there in their arms. And these are the guys that were actually the, some of the first technical divers there ever were. Billy Deans is there in the center with his uh, uh, black suit on. Uh, Captain Steve Belindo is a, a gray haired guy in the back. Uh, I'm the guy in front of him uh, in the blue suit. Uh, that's before I started dyeing my hair gray. Uh, then you have over here on the far right, uh, you've got uh, uh, Joel uh, Silverstein, who actually ran the, the Subaqua Journal. It, it's not in print anymore, but it was the Bible for the uh, for the divers. In fact, you can see right in front there. There's a right behind the sign. There's a a, a big uh, trash can full of of uh, shells that we got out of that that ship. So these were the guys that, and. And I said, look, guys, I've got customers. They want blue ones. Please let me make blue ones. And finally, Steve Belinda got up and said, hey, guys, look, Dix came out here. He's, he's, he's supported us all these years, and he wants to make a blue. So come on, guys. We got to let him make them blue. And yeah, they all grumbled a bit. But at the end of the day, they said, yeah, you can make CF Tartar suits that are blue. And so that's what I did. And the rest is history. Anyway, um, but however, today uh, it's kind of gone back to they're all black and orange. Uh, we don't make blue ones anymore. Everybody wants black and orange ones. So that's where we are. So that's the story of CF200 material and CF200 suits. And uh, like I said, if you invest in a CF200 suit, you'll never be sorry. It may be heavy. It may take two days to dry, but it'll never let you down. It'll never let you down. So that's that con concludes my presentation on. CF turned suits, and there's the there's what they look like today. But again, uh, and and they're very soft and nimble. I mean, really, they're they're not stiff at all. They're they're very uh, uh, well. They are the best there is, really. I I I wear a TLS three fifty now because I don't go crawling around in wrecks like I used to. But uh, you can crawl into anything you want, and you're going to be fine. Okay. Sir, back to you, Jack. Okay. Uh, first question is, uh, what year time frame are we talking about that this was taking place? Uh, I would say it had to be around 65, 65, 66 in there. Uh, it, I mean, diving wasn't anywhere near what it is today. And to be honest with you, uh, your technical divers today no more than the aquanauts, the aquanauts that were in Sea Lab Two did at the time. I mean, really, we didn't know much. We, you know, it was all, it was all mysteries to us. Okay. Next question is from Donald. He says his CS two hundred suit lasted twenty six years, and he got a new one two years ago. 
um, and was told that the material is not as good as the old material. Um, and plus he's already had the zipper replaced. Uh, what are the challenge, challenges in quality and materials today? Okay, zippers. Zippers have nothing to do with the material the suit's made out of. Uh, and uh, we, we are constantly fighting a battle with YKK because it, the teeth of the zipper never wear out. It's the material that's the, 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 the nylon material that's in the uh, tape that the zipper is in. That's what wears out. And, and you can, uh, if, you, if you keep your, your, soup, your, your zipper clean and you keep it lubricated, it'll last a lot longer than if you don't. Now, Let's go back now, now, then in the material. Over time, there has been chemistry changes in the, in the rubber that's in the suit, in the CF toner material. As far as I know, the rubber that's in the suit today, even though it has changed, is, uh, is, is every bit up to the task because the main thing that's holding it is the nylon lining on the outside of the suit. The, the rubber inside has to be strong enough to withstand uh, wear and tear, punctures, things of that nature. And I believe the current material is. So I don't think you're gonna find that your new suit is gonna wear out. The zipper may wear out, but the suit itself shouldn't wear out. Did, uh, did I answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, let me step in just a little bit on that. Um, through the years, um, the CF200 material uh, before it comes into to DUI and, and is processed um, was actually made by different manufacturers. So at one point in time, that material was made, you know, in one facility and then it has changed being made in different places. So there's certain maybe slight quality differences in that. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. And uh, it used to be made by Rubitex in Bedford, Virginia. They no longer, they don't make foam rubber in the United States anymore. It's all made overseas. And that's a, that's a real tragedy in my view. So in the recent year, we've also um, invested some time into a slightly newer version of that CF200 material that has um, more stretch in all, all directions because the other material would stretch in one direction farther than it would in the other. Um, so it's asymmetrical. The new uh, CF200 material is more symmetrical. So its side stretch is the same as its length stretch now. Correct. So that's Correct. A forward. Correct. The other thing is about the zipper itself. Uh, from two years ago, in fact, just this last year, um, we've introduced a new zipper uh, with working with YKK uh, that has new tape. And that's the material that uh, Dick was talking about that seals the suit. And that tape is much more robust and does not wear out as fast. Um, and again, just as an example, I've been diving that new zipper for a year now. Um, and not to show off, I don't recommend this for anybody, um, but I've only used zipper wax on it four times. Um, and this zipper still looks pretty relatively new or in good shape. Um, so we are looking at always improving products over time. Yeah, um, we argue with uh, YKK makes waterproof zippers. They make the best one in the world. There's a bunch of different ones made, uh, T-Zip and a bunch of others. But, but whenever we test them, they don't hold up. Uh, so YKK still does the best. But even then, when we, when we s say there's a problem, they never, YKK never questions it. They just send an engineer out to visit us because they know that, that, that we are the most picky people out there. And um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the heart of our suit. I mean, that's, that's the part that's gonna wear out the fastest and we don't want that. Okay, the next question comes from Matt. Uh, what's the difference with the CF300 and what happened to it? Okay, the CF300, what I was attempting to do with CF300 material was make something thinner. Okay, when, when we start, we create what's called a bun, and, and it's a big chunk of rubber, okay? And, and then they run it through a machine that that's, is called skiving, where they, where they slice it off in thin layers. 
Okay, what I wanted was to make the material even thinner than it is now. And, and, and so therefore the, the CF300 material was thinner than CF200 material. Okay, but they, when you have these bubbles, you, you remember the picture I showed you where the bubbles are next to one another? Well, if you get the bubbles too close together, then they'll rupture one bubble into another one. And the result was that some of those bubbles would rupture into one another, and it would act, the material would actually weep. It would actually weep. So uh, I only made CF CF three hundred material for a short period of time, and then I quit because once it was in the field and being used all the time, then what would happen would be it would um, uh, it, it would then start to weep, and it, it you would never get a leak like a squirt. Okay, just that the the material would become wet on the inside uh, after a period of time, and therefore uh, that's that's a, that's a weeping. It's not leaking; it's weeping, and that's unacceptable. Just unacceptable. Okay, so um, I want to go just get back to a, a question I can answer um, on my own here. Um, sorry, Dick. Um, it's from Mike, and he he asks, "Is there?" A dry suit for a latex allergy or a latex allergy dry suit. Um, most of the latex that you're talking about is actually on the wrist seals or on the neck seal. Um, we do have silicone for the wrist and the neck, and that would make it a latex allergy um, capable dry suit. Um, so there are ways around having, you know, avoidance of latex. Um, if it's coming down to contact with other materials, that's stuff that we have to address individually. Um, I have a question from Rebecca as to Dick. What is your favorite dry suit? Um, I use the TLS 350 because I'm, I just, in fact, is uh, today, today's my birthday, and I turned 83 years old today. And I used to crawl into wrecks and what, I mean, if it was there, uh, and I could, in fact, especially for lobsters, if there was a lobster in, in a crack, I'd take my tank off and crawl in there and with them and, and drag them out. Uh, today, I don't do that anymore. Uh, so therefore, I, I don't need something that's really robust material. And uh, I fly like, well, I did until the coronavirus showed up. Uh, but uh, I would fly, so therefore the TLS 350 met my needs more than anything else. So uh, I would use the TLS 350, or I'd use the CF 200 suit. So, so uh, today I'm diving a TLS 350, but I dove CF 200 for years and years. Uh, it 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 never let me down. Everyone's wishing you a happy birthday, Dick. So oh, thank you. Birthday, I didn't even know that. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, to be honest with you, I just soon forget about it. <laughs> Um, so to follow up with the question about what's your favorite suit, uh, another question from Michael is how are the CF200 and the TLS350 the same or different? Oh, they're, they're as different as night and day. Um, the CF200 suit is made for the rough diver that, you know, he gets in the wrecks and he's in there, he's, he's in there digging up stuff. Uh, uh, it, because the, on wrecks you end up with a lot of broken glass and and other stuff in there, and you you, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the sea of tarmac, you just get in, dig in, and away you go. Um, uh, the TLS 350 is lightweight, uh, dries fast, uh, uh, and and it's the least expensive suit we have that has all the bells and whistles on it. Um, uh, and and we've made them in a lot of different colors. Many of you have seen my Captain America suit. Um, uh, Dan Orr talked me out of it uh, uh, because we don't have the, the we we ran out of the materials to to, to make this the design. Uh, uh, they're they're just two different animals. Two different animals. Uh, think of the TLS 350 as a sports car, and the the CF 200 is a pickup truck. Um, so just to uh, add on to that um, from a little bit more of a technical standpoint, both materials are actually a, a trilaminate material. Um, so the TLS stands for trilaminate. Um, so P 
people think of that as a suit that has a nylon butyl rubber and then nylon uh, structure. So it's three layers of material. And the CF200 material is also three layers. So that has the same tri-laminate type of thing. The difference is, is the CF200 is made out of that, uh, the neoprene preen rubber and the TLS material um, is not. And of course, the CF200 material stretches. The TLS 300, 350 material does not. Nice. Um, so, it, so you have the the cut of the suit will actually feel different. So, if you're used to diving a CF200, and then you switch to one of the uh, fabric or material suits, um, the suit is cut differently for the fact that the material does not stretch at all. Um, so, hopefully, that answers your question. Um, so. The next question is from Helge, how much of an issue is it to dry your CF200 um, if you're not traveling? How much is it to dry if you're not traveling? Right. Uh, is it I always just hung, hung mine up in the garage. Right. So on average, I'd say depends on if you just it depends on your environment. If you live in a dry climate like San Diego, um, you can get it to dry overnight, especially if you add a fan to that. Um, yes, 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 you can. So it's more of how you dry it. Um, now for travel, um, I also dive with a TLS 350 for travel um, because of the lightweight and I can dry it with no problem overnight in a, in a more humid environment. So it's a, it's a great travel suit that way. Um, so next question is, <laughs> how's the Flex Extreme compared to the TLS 350? Okay, the, 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 there's a big difference between the Flex Extreme and the TLS 350. Uh, the Flex Extreme is made with polyester material on the outside of it, uh, the outside and inside. Uh, and uh, whereas the TLS 350 is nylon outside and inside. The, the, the difference is nylon fiber is much harder, much stronger than polyester. So therefore the polyester on a, on a, a Flex Extreme is much thicker than is the nylon uh, uh, on the TLS 350. Uh, I personally have, have never been a big favor of, of, uh, of, of, of polyester on, on, on a material. Uh, if you have it on the inside of the suit, it doesn't matter. Um, but on the outside, I, I think it does. On the other hand, most of the people that dive flex fifty uh, flex uh, suit um, aren't in a highly abrasive environment, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, by the way, I didn't talk about whale blubber, and I didn't talk about the microsphere material, which was in my original thing so i can talk about that or not talk about it as you wish mr okay. director later <laughs> um so another question from jeff is there any chance the 50 50 suit will be available again uh we can probably make the 50 50 but what we did was you see we we made the bottom out of uh out of uh, uh cf tunnel material and we made the top out of clx material so uh, you have two different materials there. So I mean, you, the, when, the, when the sales went down, we, we couldn't make it. That's it, then we can't make it again. All, wait a minute, all we need is somebody who wants to buy one. Right, well, I mean, in the, typically it's, uh, it's, we're finding that, you know, with the, we were trying a lot of things with mixing and matching the materials of the suit to accommodate certain divers. Um, and we eventually kind of gravitated towards the setups that most people were finding the most popular sets. Right. That, that, that's correct. The, the, there was not a mission for the 50-50. There was not a mission for it. There's no, no one had a need for it. It didn't meet, it didn't meet a need that uh, wasn't easily uh, satisfied by something else. Cheaper. Right. So I have another question from uh, James. Uh, how many times can I send in my dry suit in for repairs and do do it yourself repairs before it's time to give up on it? <laughs> and what's the the ration uh, the ratios? The was it the ration suit to glue holding it together? A ratio. Sorry, ah, should have read the whole thing. Um, well, first of all, it's 
obviously the suit or the, any suit material eventually is going to wear out depending on usage. Cause I have another person, uh, Bob, that says he's had us uh, over the last 32 years, he's, he's worn out two of his CF 200 suits. Um, but he says he's crawling through shipwrecks and it's never failed on dives. Um, he, so that's, he dives a lot. He dives a lot. He's a real diver. So when it comes down to repairs, it's really, um, it's kind of a catch 22. If the material's still good, then it's worth putting that effort into getting the suit fixed. If you're destroying the material to a certain point where the material is breaking it down, then you have to look at the option of, you know, upgrading or buying a new suit. Um, and that's something that when you send the suit in for repairs, um, one of the things that we always do is um, our, our service manager will evaluate the suit to see if it's worth putting the amount of effort into it for the repair. So for yeah. example, like we said, we have suits coming in that are 15 to 20 years old. Um, a lot of times they just need a new zipper. The material's fine, the seams are staying together. So yes, it's worth investing that money into that repair. Um, the, 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 think of a suit very much like you do tires on a car. It has a lot to do with how many miles are on the suit or how many miles are on the tires. When the tires wear down because they've been driven a lot of miles, uh, then it gets to the point where uh, you, you, you have to replace the tires. Whereas if you didn't drive them very much, they could be quite old and still good. I mean, I have a trike on my motorcycle uh, and it was, I got two 14 inch tires on the back of it and I will probably never replace them. Whereas on my, the front tires, on uh, on the thing, I have to replace every fifteen thousand miles. So it's uh, uh, it has more to do with miles than it does with age. It's probably my best way to describe it. Okay, um, going into uh, I have a question from Brian about storage. Um, can he can it be stored in a basement if kept far enough away from the furnace and hot water heater? Uh, do these unit pilot lights and have a significant impact on the compressed material of the suit? Uh, really what you're coming back to is ozone. Uh, a gas water heater, when you, can, when you look in and you see the blue flame, that is generating ozone. Um, when you look at an electric motor and you see little sparks in there, that's generating ozone. And the ozone attacks uh, 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 latex rubber. So therefore, if you have latex seals glued into your suit, uh, that's going to that's going to deteriorate in a short period of time. Particularly in Southern California, we have a lot of of ozone in the air. So therefore, if you've got zip seals. Uh, you're best off to take the zip seals out of your suit, put them in a plastic bag, Ziploc bag, squeeze all the air out, and put them uh, put put them waste where ozone doesn't get to them. If you do that, your your seals will last a very long time. If you don't, you know, nine months to a year is all you're going to get out of them. Whereas if you live up in Minnesota where they don't have a lot of ozone, you your seals are going to last you two or three years easy enough. So uh, that's that's where the ozone comes into it. It has nothing to do with a, with a TLS material or a CF tunnel material. All, all that's going to last the same period of time because uh, the ozone does not attack those materials. Uh, did I answer the question? Yeah. Um, in general, I mean, storage does matter with your dry suit. Um, I mean, I tell people the best way to store your dry suit is to actually use your dry suit. Um, there's no, no reason to put it in <laughs> storage. Um, I dive a dry suit year round. Um, even in traveling to a warm climate, I will still drive a dry suit. Um, so 80 degree water in the Bahamas, I'm still diving a dry suit because I want to, I plan on being in the water for over two hours at a time. Um, so four hours of my day, I'm going to be uh, staying dry. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> not, I mean, just in general, just like a car, like Dick was referring to, you have to do maintenance on things. Um, even if you don't drive the car, the car is breaking down while it's in storage. Um, so if you do put your dry suit in storage, always have, depending on you know the length of time, if you're just talking about like a month or something, it's a little bit different than if you put it in storage for like a couple of years, 
when you take that out, I would highly recommend that you get the suit tested um, just to make sure that it's in diveable condition just for safety, um, safety reasons. Um, there's another question about um, dry gloves and the Kubi gloves. Um, I, I don't, Dick, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the Kubi rings. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a ring system that can be put on dry suits. Um, just to answer that real quickly, we don't install the rings directly on the suit because of the uh, aluminum material um, with binding to the material of the dry suit. Um, we found that it is not a recommended way we would put those on. I know a lot of people are using the QB rings with our zip seal, um, latex zip seals. And they'll actually use the clamp on version of the Kubi ring um, for the suit. Um, just for people who aren't familiar with the Kubi rings, it's a, it's a system for attaching dry gloves to your dry suit. So you can work with your suit on and have your hands exposed. And then right before you dive, you can attach them um, and then continue your dive. Um, so we're coming up to our time here. I don't want to push this over. Um, over our two hours here, or two hours, um, our hour limit. Um, I'd like to just uh, give you an update on a presentation that's coming on May 21st. Um, this is gonna be a, a joint presentation with, with Dick and Faith um, Ortiz, who worked together to come up with the first women's dry suit and the custom uh, patterns for that dry suit on, the, on May 21st. Uh, we're still working on uh, what we're going to present next week, but uh, just to give you a little heads up for what's coming out in two weeks from now. And just to go back real quickly, um, again, DUI is open. So if you have suit orders or um, repairs or anything like that, please send them in. Um, we are working on them at this time. So uh, again, Dick, happy birthday. And <laughs> I guess that's our presentation for today. Um, Please check back. Oh, I have, sorry, I almost completely forgot one of the most important things I wanted to uh, talk about here on the closing. I am going to post this in the chat window. Um, we have all of these videos uh, for Deep Dive with DUI um, as a YouTube channel. Um, I put the link in the, the chat area. Um, I will also have them posted on the Dive DUI website that you can go to, to um, to view these presentations at any time at, at your leisure. So, um, so th again, thanks for coming out and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Dick. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.